them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled. And twelve baskets of leftover fragments were taken up by them. May the Lord bless the reading of his word or hearing. You may have your seats. This morning we are speaking on the subject. God still feeds the hungry. Amen. How many of you know that the God that we serve, he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. If he did it back then, he can do it today. He still feeds the hungry. And this opening verse of our text is a transitionary verse because it connects what precedes this incident of the feeding of the 5,000 with what immediately happened before. We need to know what happened before because it's foundational to what happens in our text. Someone say foundation. Verse 10 points to a foundation that we need to take note of. What does verse 10 say? The first part of that verse, it says, And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. The apostles had just returned from a ministry campaign. In fact, it was their first solo ministry campaign without the presence of Jesus. You would recall that at the beginning of chapter 9, and you can look at chapter 9, the beginning, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. The next thing he did was to send them out to preach the gospel of the kingdom and to heal the sick. He did not go with them. He sent them out. And they obeyed. And they had now returned with great news of success. And this is what the writer is talking about in verse 10. That they had just come back from this ministry campaign. They were giving a report of all the things that they had seen. And what I find interesting is that upon their return they were not referred to as disciples as they were when they were sent if you check it out in verse in verse 1 of chapter 9 could we have verse 1 of chapter 9 notice that he called what his 12 what disciples, disciples. let's go back to verse 10 so when he called them they were referred to as disciples. Verse 10. When they came back, what did it say? And what? And the apostles. They were now called apostles. What had changed? They had been sent out. An apostle is one who is sent out. With the same power and authority of the sender. To represent the sender. 
Now you understand why Jesus didn't have to accompany his disciples. He gave them the same power and authority he was operating in and he sent them out. So there was a transformation. They went out as disciples but they came back as apostles. Because he sent them equipped with the same tools that he had been using, that he had been modeling to get the job done. So Jesus didn't have to be physically present because they were carrying the same power that he carried, which was the Holy Spirit. Now, what I've just said there is an amazing insight. This is the key message in the text. That the same power which flowed successfully in the ministry of Jesus Christ when he walked the earth is the same power that's available to you and I today. Amen. He's called the Holy Spirit. And so at this point in the budding ministry of the disciples, they did not grasp this message. Although they were being mightily used to set people free, they still didn't grasp the message. And unfortunately, this is the same problem we have today. Many modern day disciples are failing to grasp the message that the same power that flowed in the ministry of Jesus Christ is available to us today. Amen. You see, God is still in the business of feeding the hungry. But not in the ways that you may think. He's not sending manna from heaven. <laughs> As he did in the Old Testament. He's not doing it that way. He is not coming down himself to take the bread, break it and bless it and multiply it. He's not doing that. No, the way that he continues to feed the hungry whether they are hungry for bread, hungry for finances, hungry for healing, is through the hands of the average believer, like you and me. That's how God is doing it. And this is what we see in the text. This is what Jesus modeled before his disciples. And God wants to do the same thing through you and I. But again, many of us, we miss the plot. Because although the disciples, they were transformed from disciples to apostles, although they saw supernatural power flowing through their hands to heal the sick and drive out demons, they didn't realize that the same power that they were just using, that they came to report about, is that same power was available to feed the hungry. We didn't realize that. Let's take a closer look at the text. And let's see what happened. There are three movements in the text that I want to highlight that demonstrates God's commitment to feed the hungry through you. The first movement is this. The apostles wanted to send the hungry people away when Jesus wanted to feed them. And whenever you feel ill-equipped to perform supernatural ministry, I want you to know that Jesus thinks the exact opposite. Why? Because he has given us power and authority. He has given us power and authority over all the power of the enemy. And these disciples, they ought to have known better. Yet, when they realized that the hour was late, and the crowds had been with Jesus for a long time in this remote location, what did they come to Jesus? They came to Jesus and they said, send the people away that they may go and buy provisions. These are the same guys who were just used to heal the sick and drive out demons. 
Now, there's another situation there. The people are hungry and they come and tell Jesus, send the people away. You would think that coming on the heels of seeing supernatural ministry through their own hands, that they would have been more confident. I mean, if you've seen the sick healed, if you've seen demons being driven out through your hands, through your mouth, isn't that supposed to embolden you? Isn't that supposed to create an expectation in you to see more? To see the hungry fed? This is what Jesus expected. Jesus expected them to connect the dots. Because the same power he had given them at the beginning of chapter 9 to heal the sick, drive out demons, is the same power that they had at their fingertips to feed the hungry. But they didn't see it. They missed it. And sadly, many of us today, we miss it. We may see the power of God flowing to give us breakthrough in one area. You may see the hand of God, you know, protect you from an accident. You may see the hand of God heal you of some sickness. You may see the hand of God at work in your life. But when it comes to some other area, somehow we think that God's power is somehow limited or restricted. And like the, like the apostles, when the hungry come to us, instead of feeding them, what do we do? We send them away. We say, I can't supply what you need. What you, what you need is a little too big for little old me. And so we send them away. We send them into the towns and the villages and the so-called experts. We send them to the doctors, the psychologists, the herbalists, the banks, and so on. But what does Jesus do when the hungry comes to us? Let's look at verse 13. They came to him and they said, Lord, send the people away. What did Jesus say? He said, you give them something to eat. You. This is the same Jesus that is saying to you and I this morning, you feed them. Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So when the hungry comes to our churches, when the hungry comes to our homes, Jesus says, you feed them. I want you to notice what Jesus did not say. He did not say ask God to feed them. He did not say ask me to feed them. He did not say pray without ceasing until they are fed. No. He says you feed them. The key word here is you. In other words, Jesus expects you to meet their need. Why? Why would Jesus have such an expectation? It's because the solution to the people's hunger wasn't to be found somewhere in the town, in some faraway land. No, it was right there in the hands of the disciples. The solution was already in their hands. And I want to say to you that the solution to the hunger of many people in this world is in your hands. The solution to the hunger, whether people are hungry for the word, hungry for bread, hungry for finances, hungry for breakthrough, the solution is in your hands. And so Jesus says, you feed them. The apostles had the solutions in their lap and they did not even know it. We have the solution to people's hunger right in our lap. And we don't even know it. <laughs> the solution to your financial dilemma isn't in the bank. 
it isn't with some wealthy businessman the solution to your broken relationship isn't with some counselor it isn't in some book somewhere it's in your hands jesus placed power in your hands to feed those who are hungry including yourself and i believe if jesus were physically present here this morning and you came to him he would say you feed them you provide for their needs because the solution is in your hands you just need to use it this takes me to the second movement in the text i want us to see and it's this when we fail to see divine realities jesus would redirect us to his word when we fail to see divine realities jesus has a way of redirecting us to his word when he told these apostles when they came to him uh, they came to him and they said send the people away he told them feed the people they failed to connect the dots with the miracles that they had performed earlier and although he was now speaking a fresh word into their hearing feed the people they still didn't get it that word should have awakened something in them why because jesus never asked us to do something that he didn't equip us to do the fact that he said feed the people meant that they had the capability to feed the people you say how do i know this because in chapter in, in chapter 9 verse 1 he gave them power and authority to move in the supernatural but they still didn't get it listen to their response when jesus said feed the people verse 13 it says and they said we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people in another version of this story they said we have five loaves and two fish but what are these among so many the size of the crowd we are told was five thousand men plus plus women and children so a conservative estimate of that crowd is easily about 15,000 people and that's why the apostle said even if we go out to buy food we're not going to even have enough money to feed that crowd 15,000 people in fact we can't even find enough food to feed these these people and i imagine if a trini was there <laughs> <laughs> when jesus say you feed them you just say boy we dogs dead water more than flour crap or smoke we pipe that is what a trini would have say but not just a trini isn't that the kind of things we just say as believers when you size up the hunger when you look at what you have versus what you need we say the same thing what is that among so many when you look at the size of the hunger when you look at the size of your bills and the money you have you say what are these among so many you know why we say things like that it's because we are being controlled by sense knowledge instead of revelation knowledge sense knowledge is what you perceive with your senses what you see what you hear what you feel we think that what we see hear, feel and touch is more real than spiritual realities but the scripture says the things which are what unseen are more real than the things which do appear and so because we are locked into sense knowledge it produces doubt in our hearts 
Because oftentimes what we see in the natural contradicts what God says in his word. I imagine when these disciples saw the five loaves and the two fish and they look at the crowd and say, boy, we dogs dead. <laughs> they were being controlled by sense knowledge. And that's why they failed to see the truth in Jesus' word when he said, you feed them. So Jesus had to redirect them. Because he was operating, not in sense knowledge, but revelation knowledge. You say, what's the difference? Revelation knowledge is based on what God's word said. Revelation knowledge does not take into account what the world says. Revelation doesn't take into account what we see. For we walk by what? Faith and not by sight. Revelation knowledge pays no attention to what we see in the natural. Because revelation knowledge knows that the unseen is more real than the things that do appear. So what does revelation knowledge say? Revelation knowledge says, God is speaking. He says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. All of the silver and the gold, they are mine. The psalmist testifies. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The apostle Paul declares, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. So in God there is no lack. Only abundance. I need to repeat that for someone this morning. When you look at your hunger situation, when you look at your circumstances, all you see is lack, shortage, not enough. I came here to tell you this morning that in God there is no lack. There is no shortage. I don't care what the situation is. In God, there is no lack. He says, I will supply all your needs according to my riches in glory. I mean, when you just survey the world, look at the grass, look at the lilies of the field, all you can see is abundance. The grass is just growing all over the place. When you look at the sky, and the expanse. When you look at the sea, all you can see is abundance. Because the God that we serve, he's a God of increase. He's a God of abundance. He says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. He's a God of abundance. There's no lack. And so when Jesus looked at the hungry people before him, he saw abundance where the disciples saw lack. At no time did Jesus flinch. At no time did Jesus scratch his head and say, oh, What are going to do, boy? What are going to do? You know, sometimes he praying and he's saying, Lord, what are going to do? What are going to do? What are going to do? You are being controlled by sense knowledge. When you understand revelation knowledge, you will not flinch. You will not buckle. You will not bow because you know that the unseen is more real. Than what appears. Jesus did not flinch in the midst of their hunger. And I'm saying we must not flinch. When you are facing a situation of hunger. Because we are releasing words of life. Words of truth. So what does Jesus do when we fail to believe? When we fail to grasp the message? What does Jesus do? How does he respond? Does he abandon us? No, he has patience. He redirects us to his word. What was the word to the apostles? You feed them. You feed them. So he redirected them to the word. By showing them how to access the solution. That was already in their hands. Mighty God. 
And the first thing that Jesus did in redirecting Hallelujah. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. Every plan of the enemy is nullified. You see, the enemy doesn't want you to hear this message, you know. The enemy doesn't want you to hear this message. In redirecting us, the first thing that Jesus did, he asked the disciples, what do you have? Now don't misunderstand the reason why Jesus is asking what they had. He's not asking because he doesn't already know. He's asking to let them know that no matter how meager, no matter how small your supply is in your own eyes, he wants you to know that it is enough. You hear what I tell you? Jesus asks you what you have not because he doesn't already know. He wants you to know that no matter how small your supply is, it is enough. That is the challenge for you and I this morning. When you face your hunger situation, know that whatever you have, it is enough. Think about the widow in the time of Elijah. She said, he said, woman, bake me a cake. He said, all I have is a little bit of meal and a little chunks of oil. <laughs> I'm going to use that to feed my son and then we're going to die. Elijah said, do what you said, but bake me that cake first. And as she obeyed the man of God, that little bit of meal, that little bit of oil, multiplied supernaturally what caused that to multiply was the word and her obedience to the word caused that meal and the oil to multiply it was more than enough I want to say to you that the little that you think you have is more than enough it's more than enough there is supernatural power in your hands. And when we fail to see the divine realities of what is possible, Jesus redirects us to his word because his word is enough. And because his word is enough, you are enough. And because you are enough, you have enough. To feed the hungry. You hear what I said? You have enough. And this leads me to the third and final point I want to make this morning. And it's this. When you fail to embrace the re your responsibility as sons of God. Jesus puts back that responsibility into your hands. He doesn't take it. He puts it back into your hands. Jesus has a very interesting way. Of redirecting us. We said the first thing he, do, he does is to question us. But the questions is not to enlighten him. It's to enlighten us. He lets us know that no situation. No hunger situation or circumstances beyond your reach. That's why he said in John 14. You shall do the same works that I do. And even greater works. You think Jesus was lying? He said that. You will do the same works. What are some of the works he did? He multiplied fish and so on. He multiplied bread. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He says you will do the same works. And even greater works. I believe Jesus. The second thing he does as he redirects us. He puts us at ease. In verse 14 of this text, he said to the apostles, tell the people to sit down in groups of 50. In other words, tell everybody to relax themselves. 
If you are faced with a major hunger, you're faced with a major challenge, God's word to you is to sit down and relax. Because who of you, by worrying, could solve the problem? Worrying never solves any problem. So relax yourself. That's what Jesus would say. Relax! And stand back and see what the Lord will do. Because he's about to put the responsibility back into the hands of someone who will get the job done. What is the next thing that the Lord did in the text? After he said, tell the people to sit down, relax themselves. You see, many times we are so worried and cumbered about by so many things. We like, um, we like uh, Martha. But Jesus wants us to be like Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus. Relax yourself. Stop pulling out your hair. Stop trying to, you know, calculate what is going to happen in the future. Relax yourself. That's what the word of the Lord is saying. Relaxed. God has this covered. He has you covered. So, I want you to remember the original word, right? What was the original word that he told his disciples? He said, you feed them. You feed them. Remember that. He didn't revoke that word. And so let's, as we look at what he does next, I want you to remember that. In verse 16, let's see what he does next. It says, he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. And gave them to the disciples to see. The five loaves and the two fish from the disciples. I want you to stay with me here. He took them. The second verb is the word blessed. He took the loaves and the fish and he blessed them. He took, he blessed. The third verb is the word broke. He took them, he blessed them, and then he broke them into smaller pieces. You all with me? The fourth and final verb is the word gave. After he broke the loaves and the fish into smaller pieces, what did he do? He gave them. Who did he give them to? He gave them to the disciples. It didn't say that he went to the multitude of people sitting down and eating. You know. He gave it back to the disciples. What a powerful revelation. Question. In whose hands did the loaves and the fish multiply? Yes. Or in the hands of the disciples? Amen. I want to put to you this morning that the miracle of supernatural multiplication did not happen in the hands of Jesus. It happened in the hands of the disciples as they went to distribute the broken pieces to feed the hungry. It supernaturally multiplied. This is how the miracle took place. The multiplication didn't happen in Jesus' hands. When he blessed it, when he broke it, it didn't multiply. 
is when he put it back in the hands of the disciples and he told them, go and feed the people. You see how committed Jesus is to his word? What, did, what was the original word? What did he say? You feed them. So who was feeding them? Was it Jesus? No, it was the disciples. You see, Jesus' intervention is not to take the responsibility out of our hands, you know, because we fail to see. No, his intervention is to put the responsibility right back in our hands because he saw. What did he see? He saw that they had the power and the authority all along to feed the people. And as I conclude this message this morning, I want to let you know that in spite, in spite of the great hunger that surrounds us, we already have what it takes to feed every person. Because people are not just hungry for food. There are people who are hungry for finances. There are people who are hungry for healing, deliverance, and breakthroughs, and so on. And yet, instead of rising to the occasion, many times what do we do? We send the people away, just like the apostles. We say, go to the secular experts. But Jesus is saying to you and I this morning, don't send them away. You feed them. Because God is still feeding the hungry. He's doing it through the hands of average believers like you and me all around the world. You see, you can feed them. Because when you fail to see divine realities, Jesus redirects us to his word. Because his word is more than enough. You can feed them because when you fail to embrace your responsibility as a son of God, Jesus puts back that responsibility right into your hands. You know why? Because the solution has been in your hands all along. Even if you didn't know it. God says you are the answer to someone's hunger. And so stop diverting and start feeding. You feed them. Could we bow our heads this morning? Father, we give you praise. We give you honor and glory. We thank you for your word to our hearts and our hearing. I thank you, Lord, that you're still in the business of feeding the hungry. It really doesn't matter what people are hungry for. You are more than enough. You are able to meet every need. Whether there is a need for food, a need for finances, a need for healing, a need for deliverance, a need for breakthrough, a need for restoration, you are still feeding the hungry mighty God. And so, Father, I thank you that you're going to cause this word to arise in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you will stir up our, our faith to believe, to see that we have the answer to the hunger problem, mighty God. So, Lord, I pray that you will cause your people to arise, to arise and step out in faith, step out in boldness, step out and begin to feed the hungry. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If there's anyone here, you've heard the word, you are hungry for some situation or some, something in your life, but you have not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, then the first step for you is you need, to, you need to come into a relationship with Jesus. He's the one that will satisfy your hunger. And so if you are here, you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, lift your hands. We'll see it. We'll pray with you and for you this morning. Do we have anyone like that in our midst? You want to commit your life to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Praise the Lord. So I want to invite everyone to stand if there's no one here that needs to commit their life to the Lord. But this word resonated with you. I want to pray two prayers this morning. Two prayers I want to pray. I want to pray that God will open our eyes to see that we have been given power and authority to feed the hungry. That's the first prayer I want to pray this morning. And the second prayer I want to pray is those of you, you are facing a hunger situation. It may be that you're hunger, hungry for finances, you're hungry for healing, hungry for deliverance, hungry for some breakthrough. And this has been el eluding you. If you are here like that, you have a need. You have a need that needs to be satisfied. Come to the front. On this supernatural Sunday, we are going to pray with you and for you. And believe God for your breakthrough. Because healing is in our hands. Deliverance is in our hands. Breakthrough is in our hands this morning. So if there's anyone here, come to the front this morning. We're going to pray with you. Hallelujah. We give you praise. The anointing is flowing my way. There's a spirit of power and priority. It's a new season coming to me. Come on, let's sing that again. It's a new season coming my way. A fresh anointing. Flowing my way, a spirit of power and prosperity. It's a new season flowing to me. It's a new season. Come on with uplifted hands. Today, fresh anointing. It's flowing my way, it's a season of power and prosperity, it's a new season coming to me. Come on, let's sing that again. It's a new season flowing my way, a season of power. Hallelujah. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season coming to me. Hallelujah. Go, go ahead and sing that. Mighty God, we give you praise. How can we pray? Hallelujah. Praise God. We give you praise. We give you praise, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mighty God, we give you praise. Right now, I speak to these eyes. In the mighty name of Jesus, eyes be healed, be restored. In the name of Jesus, all blurry vision. Go! In Jesus' name, I speak for 2020 vision. Restoration of your vision right now in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your power and your presence to heal, to deliver, to set free in Jesus' name. Be whole. Be set free in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus.
Father, we thank you for this baby that is blessed of God. You are the one, Lord. You are the one who sent this baby. And so we speak life, we speak strength, we speak health and vitality to the baby in the mother's womb. Fill the baby, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Mighty God, we declare that the baby will go to the fountain in the mighty name of in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for healing, restoration. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. All is well. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. It's a new season and it's coming to me. It's a new a brand new day, a fresh anointing, it's coming my way, it's a season of power and prosperity, it's a new season, it's a new season, and it's so right now in the mighty name of Jesus, me. I speak to the eyes, season. I speak it's a new, new vision. Restoration of sight in the name of Jesus. I command the pupil, retina, every part of the eyes to be healed and to be restored in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive your healing right now. Father, we thank you for sending him our way. Thank you, Lord, for all that you are going to do in and through his life. You're going to raise him up as a mighty vessel in your kingdom. Mighty God, let your spirit rest upon him. Change this man, Lord, from the inside out. Let there be a new season in his life. God says there is a new season beginning today. There's a new season beginning today. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. I speak newness in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. It's coming my way. It's a season of power. Thank you. And prosperity. Coming upon Sister Natalie. New season. New season in every area of life. Break every shackle. Every chain. Has it's mitigated against her and has kept her back. Break and destroy yokes and bondages. In the mighty name of Jesus, loose you right now. Step into that new season. New season of purpose. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do in the coming weeks. Lord, that you're going to download inside direction. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for prosperity, Sister Natalie, in every endeavor. In the mighty name of Jesus, we declare it done in Jesus' name.
worship us, mighty God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord Father, I thank you that everything that the enemy meant for evil, you are turning it around right now, in the mighty name of Jesus. Brother Terry, I hear the word, turn around. There's a turn around taking place. A turn around. In the mighty name of Jesus. God says, forget the former things. Forget the former things. And press forward towards the mark of the upward calling God. Father, I pray that you will give Brother Terry a new anointing, a fresh outpouring of your spirit to pursue his purpose and destiny in the mighty name of Jesus. Terminate every assignment of the enemy upon his life. Every form of stagnation we terminate right now. And so I prophesy acceleration. Acceleration of purpose. Acceleration of destiny in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus we declare it now. It's a brand new day, a fresh anointing, it's growing my way. Father, we give you praise. It's a season of Thank you, power, Lord. Thank you, prosperity. And Father, today we call, it's a new season. we call and identify it's Mark by name, mighty God, you see, and know all that he is facing, it's every trial, season. every test. Lord, we know that you have marked him. You have appointed him for such a time as this. And mighty God, I pray that your spirit will fall fresh upon Mark. Break every yoke and every chain of bondage upon his life. Lose him right now. Mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you will put your hook in his jaw. He will be restored. Lord, restore the joy of his salvation. The joy of his salvation. Open his eyes to see, mighty God, what you would have him to do in this season. So, Lord, I pray a 180 degree turnaround in his life right now. In Jesus' name.
coming to the Philadelphia Tabernacle a new season of power and prosperity we declare it, we decree it in the mighty name of Jesus and Lord we thank you for all that you have done here today in Jesus name and the church say amen so we are going to wait on you at this time for the tithes and the designated offering we will invite our worship team to return praise the Lord It's a new season, it's a brand new day, a fresh anointing is blowing my way. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season and it's coming to me. Yes, it's a new season, a new day, fresh and anointing is flowing my way. It's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season. It's a new scene. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, this morning we praise you. We thank you, O God, Father, for life this morning. We thank you, dear Lord, Father, for good health and strength, Lord, Father. We thank you, O God, Father, for food, clothing, and shelter. We thank you, God, Father, for this privilege to come before you this morning to give back a part of what you have so faithfully given unto us this morning. Thank you, God, Father, for the various jobs that you have blessed us with. We thank you, God, Father, for each and every one who had to give this morning. We thank you, God, Father, for those who didn't even have to give this morning. We pray, God, Father, you'd continue to provide for us this morning. That you'd continue to bless us. You'd bless those who didn't have today. We thank you, God, Father, for these finances. God, Father, I pray, God, Father, you'd bless them. That you'd multiply them. That you'd use them, oh God, for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. We pray, God, Father, you'd minister to those who are still, oh God, administrate over these finances. That you'd bless them with wisdom and the ability to use these finances wisely, Lord. So let your will be done today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you very much, Brother Edwards. Listen, everybody have a quick seat. Um, I just read that Trinidad has now been placed on yellow alert, so we're not going to be here long, right? We have to exercise wisdom. There's also something going on out in the yard, so please be very careful when you leave in the church. I will post all the announcements. We don't have time for announcements today. The worship team will just meet with you for a quick five, ten minutes, and I'll, I'll post everything. I don't think we need to waste time right now. Do have a blessed day, Pastor. I think we need to pray for the country because they just placed us on yellow alert. That hurricane is a demon because yesterday he was coming and then we, he leave. Now he's coming back. I mean, come everybody. Let's pray for our country because Tobago is our country too. Enjoy the rest of your day and see you all on Thursday for prayer meeting. Praise the Lord. Let's stretch forth our hands. Father, we thank you. We give you praise and honor and glory. You are worthy of all praise. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us power and authority. Even over the elements. And so right now, I speak to that storm. I command that storm to be diverted into the sea right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, that there will be no harm and danger upon our country. In the mighty name of Jesus, I take authority over that storm. And I command you to dry up, to dissolve, and to be diverted into the sea right now. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray that as we leave this place, but not your presence, take us to our home safely. In the mighty name of Jesus, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. And may his peace be with you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.